This is a specialist in epidemiology, very credentialed, somebody from Harvard Medical School, saying that any public health plan that requires radical changes to behavior and perfect compliance is doomed to fail. Then why do we have a mask mandate? I mean, I believe this woman. I think she's correct. I've been saying this since the beginning of this thing. Any public health plan that requires radical change in a person's behavior? What do you think a shutdown was? Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. There is a CNN article out that is kind of playing to this, and especially because colleges opened up and, and there are a lot of people that are concerned, and, and it's not wrong to be concerned, in ignorance. If there is something that is an unknown that is potentially dangerous, concern and maybe even a little anxiety is not necessarily unwarranted or even an unhealthy thing. What is unhealthy is when there is evidence, there is data that suggests that something is not dangerous and continuing to be anxious about it because you are living in ignorance. That is not a good thing. And unfortunately, that seems to be the position of the entire staff here at CNN. So CNN put this article up that is talking about how horrible it is that colleges reopened and how they did everything wrong and there's there's no good that came out of it and it was just too risky and they shouldn't have done so. By the way, I would like to note that this article is not a CNN opinion piece. You know, if it was Chris Cecilia or Brian Stelter, the the gayest straight man that has ever lived, and I still don't believe he's straight, but anyway, <laughs> Brian Stelter goes on, and if they were coming out and like, this is a CNN opinion piece, and it was all of this stuff, it'd still be wrong, but at the very least, it's an opinion piece. This is not an opinion piece. CNN has this listed as a normal CNN article, despite the fact that it's completely unsubstantiated in some places, and it's not flat out lying, or at least anywhere that I could find, but it's giving a whole lot of presumptions and it's giving a whole lot of conclusions that are not rooted in fact. And that's the thing that I find so disturbing about this. Now, keep in mind, I'm going to read the headline. This is not listed as a CNN opinion piece, and this is the headline. Colleges knew the risk, but they reopened anyway. Here's how they got it all wrong. Does that sound like objective journalism to you? That sounds like you're drawing a conclusion. That doesn't sound like you're presenting me with facts. That's saying, I'm drawing a conclusion, college has got everything wrong. That's not journalism. It might be an opinion piece, might be an editorial, but it is not journalism. And so CNN tries this, again, goes along with this ridiculousness, Leah Amsley is the one that put this together, and it is just absolutely dreck. There's no redeeming qualities to this article whatsoever. And here's the, we'll just read an excerpt from it. Many schools ultimately decided to welcome students back, informing their communities that new safety precautions are in place and COVID tests remain ready. But the safety measures weren't enough. There are now more than 40,000 cases of COVID-19 among students, faculty, staff, and colleges at colleges and universities nationwide, according to a CNN tally from earlier this month. Now, you can almost read the emphasis they're trying to put in there that the, the author is doing. I mean, it really is. It's almost like they're trying to say, 40,000 cases! I mean, that really is the, the tenor and tone of the article, and I'm reading into it a little bit because you have to, because it's written, it's not like a, it's not a podcast or a, or a video production. But they're making this big deal. It's like, well, clearly the safety precautions they put in weren't enough because now there's 40,000 cases. Okay, why would 40,000 cases be a cause for concern? At no point, any time in this article, anywhere... Do they talk about hospitalizations? Do they talk about deaths? Do they talk about impacts to the students? Nowhere. 
All they do is say 40,000 cases and assume that that is enough to convince the reader that what the colleges did and, and the safety measures they put into place were inadequate and they didn't take this seriously enough. Look, the cases were going to happen no matter what colleges did. Frankly, I'm astounded that 40,000 is the only uh, amount of people that they got here. I'm, I'm really quite fascinated by the fact that that actually is the case. They, they never even attempt to make the case to the reader that kids getting infected is a bad thing. Because if you've got a whole bunch of kids getting infected and recovering, many of which may very well be asymptomatic, we have no idea, especially considering how common a COVID-19 case of someone being completely asymptomatic is, we have no idea how many of these 40,000 were either completely asymptomatic or, you know, got the sniffles for a couple of days, essentially. I know that you don't actually get sniffles with COVID-19. I realize it's a dry cough and all that. I'm just using that as an example. P people that, you know, didn't get very sick is the point that I'm trying to make here. So people not getting very sick and then recovering after a few days and going about their merry way, that's a really positive thing. Having a bunch of young, healthy people that now have immunity, that gets us one step closer to herd immunity. That is a very, very positive thing, but CNN never even considers that. They apparently having any cases at all, regardless of the results of those cases, is enough to convince you that colleges are very, very bad and irresponsible and don't care about the lives of their students. Uh, to further illustrate this, let's actually look at some of the data and statistics, do what CNN refused to do with these numbers. So these are, these are stats about COVID-19 at American colleges. The total, the total college students in America is roughly 20 million. The, the closest stat that I could find to this, the best stat that I could find, gave me roughly 19.9 million. But, you know, we'll round up because it was darn close. We'll say roughly 20 million students in the United States of America. Now, COVID-19 cases among college students, as CNN just told us, roughly 40,000. Okay, well, 40,000 is not very much out of a population of 20 million. In fact, that would mean that of the percentage of infected students, it's 0.2. So we're talking one-fifth of 1%. Not even a whole percentage of students are infected, and yet this is the, the big number that they want to put out there, that it's 40,000 students. It's absurd. 40,000 students out of a population of 20 million is simply not that much. So even if you were operating off of the assumption that cases themselves are bad, regardless of what the results of those cases are, even if you were operating from that worldview, this is still an incredibly infinitesimally small amount. Now, here's the thing, because I want to be fair here. The CDC estimates that roughly 10 times that amount actually do have the virus, and that's in the general population, which would mean that the number's actually 2%. It's still really small, and that also means that that other nine-tenths of the people that didn't have cases, that they all survived too because they didn't even know they had the virus. They were so unaffected by it that they didn't even know they have it. If it actually is 2%, we can go ahead and estimate that it is going to be roughly 10, 10 times more because that's what the CDC estimations say. But here's the thing. I'm even willing to give them more than that because since we're talking about a very young age demographic, that probably means that there were a lot more asymptomatic cases than even the average person, which would mean that it's actually more than 10 times that amount. But that still doesn't make a difference because these are all healthy people that didn't have the virus that were so unaffected by it, they didn't even know they were sick. And so CNN trying to make the case that colleges and schools should be ashamed of themselves for acting so recklessly and irresponsibly, it's just dumb. And that becomes even more clear when you look at some of these stats as well. So we'll go ahead and, and pull this up here. The total college students in America... Um, 20,000, the total deaths among college students, 60. 60 deaths out of 20 million students. That, by the way, means that your odds of death if you are a college student at an American college is 0 
zero zero three percent or one in three hundred thirty three thousand three hundred and thirty three guys there's just nothing here there's nothing there's nothing here that number is so small it's embarrassing your odds of death there are practically non-existent. By the way, I saw a uh, an AL.com cartoon that came out today that was it was showing Donald Trump with this giant grim reaper and he was talking at a speech last night. And President Trump said, "It's affecting virtually nobody." And so it has Donald Trump saying that same line on a cartoon with the grim reaper behind him. Uh, with the 200,000 American deaths, because we just passed the 200,000 mark in America. 200,000 Americans have lost their lives to this virus, which is still a very small amount of a population of 326 million. But that is the, you know, th th that's what was going on there. And, and so AL.com put out that cartoon, kind of ignores the fact that he was specifically talking about college students. Well, guys, if you're looking at 60 deaths out of 20 million college students, that is affecting virtually nobody. The president was 100% correct when he said that is affecting virtually nobody. When it's affecting 0.0003% of your population, that's virtually nobody by anybody's standards. There's not a person in the world that would look at that stat if you take the politics out of it, take the COVID-19 label off of it and say, would you say that that's affecting virtually nobody in that population? They go, yeah, that's that's pretty much nobody. So uh, it's just another example of the media continuing to be dishonest, as unfortunately we've kind of come to expect at this point. AL.com, of course, is no exception to that. Now, to show you how low the risk is comparatively, remember, 60 students in college this year have died from COVID-19. The annual college deaths due to alcohol, 1,519, 25 times more than COVID. I actually found one that would show that it would be roughly 30 times more because it was right at 2,000, but I chose to use the lower stat because I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. I want to give them the absolute uh, benefit of the doubt so they're not saying that I'm just using the highest number. I'm actually using the lowest number I could find on that. And that, by the way, that figure does include alcohol-related deaths involved in car accidents, so drunk driving, that kind of thing. So if you have a college student, or if you are a college student, you are 25 times more likely to die from alcohol than you are to die from this virus. Yet what you don't see is people going around and saying that we need to close colleges down because alcoholism is a problem. They're talking about shutting down the bars, not because they're worried about alcoholism, but because they're worried about the virus. And I'm not calling for that, obviously. I'm just saying that you're far more likely to die from some kind of alcohol-related event than you are to die from COVID-19 if you're an American college student. And you might be saying, yeah, but I don't drink, or my son or daughter that's at college doesn't drink, so that's not a risk for us. Yeah, I assume that they drive. Because if you're looking at annual college deaths in car accidents, that's 1,146, which is 19 times more deadly than COVID uh, at an American college. Annual college homicides. So this is just the chance that e either through accident or on purpose, another person kills the college student 88, which is still 1.47 times more than COVID. It's not much more, but that means your college student is more likely to be axe murdered than to die from the coronavirus. That's how insanely undangerous this thing is to people in this age demographic. It's just absurd that they're trying to convince us that we need to be terrified of this, that you should be cowering at home, the, the colleges should never have opened back up, or if they should open back up, they should have done it completely differently. CNN is fear-mongering over something that doesn't make any sense. This thing is just not a risk to people in this age demographic. There's no evidence that suggests that it is. CNN doing this whole routine, frankly, is, is just the height of stupidity. 
So let's go ahead and look at the uh, this next little passage in here because this is also very telling of, of CNN and where their head's at. Back in July, Julia Marcus, an infectious disease epidemiologist at the Harvard Medical School, rightfully predicted that colleges were, do, were going to blame students' behavior for any COVID-19 outbreaks. Yeah. That would be true of literally any human population. And any virus, for that matter. I mean, unless the school is going around with syringes loaded up with COVID-19 and injecting people with them, every single case of somebody getting the virus is going to be the fault of the people involved. Every single time. That doesn't mean they weren't being cautious. It doesn't mean that they were trying to do all the things to keep themselves safe. But that's how the world works. If you get sick, it was because of something you did. You picked up the virus at some point. Unless somebody specifically infected you somehow, that's on you. I, I don't understand this, the idea that colleges are supposed to be liable for the, the, for the behavior of people that happen to go to school there. I mean, we're not holding Walmart and Home Depot viable for the people that got infected when they were shut down, when they were practically the only place open. Nor should we. That's not their fault. People chose to go to Home Depot. People chose to go to Walmart. People chose to go to Lowe's. That's on them. It continues on. But the real problem, she said, is poor planning. Any public, quote, any public health plan that requires radical changes in behavior is a perfect com uh, and perfect compliance is doomed to fail, Marcus told CNN in a re recent interview, and that's exactly what's happening. I don't even know how to respond to that. This is a specialist in epidemiology, very credentialed somebody from Harvard Medical School, saying that any public health plan that requires radical changes to behavior and perfect compliance is doomed to fail. Then why do we have a mask mandate? I mean, I believe this woman. I think she's correct. I've been saying this since the beginning of this thing. Any public health plan that requires radical change in a person's behavior? What do you think a shutdown was? If the best medical minds in the country were looking at this and saying, oh, this is going to cause basic, the only way that you're going to have this work is perfect compliance. And anything that is based on that is doomed to fail. Then why did we do all of this? CNN is presenting this as some kind of example that we should have been doing things differently. But here is the expert that they're quoting, saying that any plan that basically requires perfect compliance is doomed to fail. That's every single plan. Every single plan that has come out of this virus because of how infectious it is has basically said, yeah, the only thing, the way this is going to work is if everybody complies virtually perfectly with it. That's the problem with the mask mandate in the first place. If you're not wearing it exactly perfectly, if you're not changing your mask out every 20 minutes, if you're not reusing the mask and cleaning them properly, and you're not never touching your face while you're doing it, and all of these different things, then the mask doesn't work. And that's why the mask mandate doesn't make any sense, because... It doesn't require that a person do all of those things. And if it did, it would be unenforceable. And if it did, we know that people wouldn't do it. So why have the dumb thing? This is CNN's experts, not me. It just drives me crazy that people can have this information at their fingertips and put it in an article saying that this is the reason that we need to do this. And it says the exact opposite of what they're saying that it says. Oh, man. It, I, all right, we'll, we'll move on. Many universities have prioritized requiring students to be on their best behavior, encouraging them to get tested and advising them to stay away from s social gatherings. But telling students to stay six feet away from each other, wear a mask, and wash their hands simply isn't enough, Marcus said. If school administrators could put themselves back in their 18-year-old selves for just a minute, it would become clear to them what they're asking for out of a college student is unrealistic, she said. But I think there's been a lack of empathy in what's happening on campuses. Instead, some schools, instead at some schools, students are being punished for socializing. At Purdue, three dozen students were suspended for attending an off-campus party and violating the school's social distancing rules. 
Are they forgetting that these people are adults? Who's at colleges? Not a bunch of sixth graders. These are 18-year-olds. They're all adults. They can do what they want. The idea that the school should be policing people, and by the way, the epidemiologist seems to agree with me on this. I don't think that we're at odds with one another. I'm agreeing with the sentiment that she's expressing. Punishing them or, or trying to be, you know, the, the social distancing police as a university for students when they're doing things off campus and after school hours doesn't make any sense. And she seems to agree with that premise that that was a ridiculous plan from the very beginning and that those guidelines were ridiculous. I agree with that. I think that she's actually 100% correct on that. The colleges cannot control their students, especially when you consider that these colleges are dealing with students that are adults. It may be a little different if you're talking about a boarding school for high schoolers, something like that. Okay, there, I get that there's a little bit of a difference there because then the school is actually responsible for the behavior of the students given and put in their charge and they're basically acting as an ad hoc legal guardian. That is not the case here. We're dealing with major universities across the country. Um, but here's another thing that makes this so ridiculous. They're assuming that a bunch of 18-year-olds would not be hanging out with one another otherwise. It's true that when students come to a university, they might have more access to more people of their age. They might have larger social gatherings, and they are more likely to engage with people that they've never met before. That's certainly correct. But that doesn't last very long because they tend to sort of section themselves off into groups and cliques and they, they find their friend group at college and then just like they had in high school, they have a handful of people that they tend to hang out with and they may occasionally go to a party. Here's the thing, all that stuff happens in high school. All of it. And so the assumption here is that these 18-year-olds would not be hanging out if they were not at college. That's simply not true. Do you think that a bunch of 18-year-olds would just not have parties if they weren't at college? Do you think they would just not go out on dates and meet new people and that kind of thing if they weren't at college? They were going to be doing this stuff anyway. The whole premise of the article is based off of the idea that, oh, colleges are responsible for this because if colleges didn't exist, 18-year-olds wouldn't socialize and hang out with one another. You've got to be outside your mind. They would be hanging out with different people, probably, but they'd still be hanging out. I, the, nothing in this article makes sense. It's so frustrating, but absolutely nothing in this article makes sense. We live in a completely incurious age. And the reason that I am bothered by this is because CNN refuses to slap the opinion label on this thing, refer to it as fact, ignore all of the context, just assume that their premise is going to be accepted by their reader, and the reason they do is because they're probably right. I hate to say it, but they're probably right that the average reader is going to pick this up, look at it, read it, assume that all the conclusions that the author makes in a non-opinion piece, it's weird to even say that they're making conclusions in a piece that isn't supposed to be an editorial, that the person is going to pick this up, read all of the conclusions, never question the data, never question, okay, well, why aren't they talking about hospitalizations? Why aren't they talking about deaths? They'll never question any of those things, and CNN knows it can get away with it because it's selling confirmation buys. It's selling to an audience that already believes all of this stuff and is just looking for an article to reaffirm what they already believe. That's what burns me up so much about this, is that CNN spews out this crap all the time and they get away with it because people never question, well, why are they only giving me one stat? Why are they only giving me this side of the issue? Why does their, their premise doesn't match their conclusion? Why is that? They don't ask these things. And that's what really bothers me more than anything. They don't look for other information, other viewpoints, or what else is out there. And it, I get it. There, there's some stuff that goes on with right-wing news sources as well. I, I understand that happens sometimes there too. But it seems to be the modus operandi for the left. It, it seems to be just their default over there. And that's why I think that it, it irks me so much. A recent survey showed that the average American spends, I kid you not, eight seconds reading a news story before either commenting on it or sharing it. That means that most people are barely finishing the headline 
before spouting out an opinion on content they didn't actually watch or read. Therefore, if you are watching this and made it to the end of this video, congratulations. You are, as Bernie Sanders would say, the 1%. So now it's totally appropriate to like and subscribe.